Great conversations going on at all of those tables. We're really looking forward to hearing um, about all of your kind of ideas, your pledges, and your commitments um, to realising um, some of the recommendations um, that we have been making as an advisory council on women and girls. So thanks to all of you um, for, for that. Um, I'd now like to um, I'd like you to join with me um, to welcome our next speaker, who needs no introduction from me at all, of course, um, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. But I do want to reflect on the fact that we are only here because of her vision and commitment. At a time when so many of the gains for women and girls are under threat across the world, we are incredibly fortunate that we are in a country where not only is there recognition that this is an issue that needs to be tackled with deeds and not just words, but we have a First Minister who is willing to listen to hard truths and be constructively challenged. She asked, uh, asked us as an advisory council to make her life difficult. I'll let her be the judge of whether we have done that or not, but I would say, First Minister, there is still time. So without further ado, please welcome First Minister Nicola Sturgeon. Thank you all very much indeed. It's absolutely fantastic uh, to be here today. It's, uh, Work that all of you are doing is work that's very, very close to my heart. So it is important to me to be here, to listen, to engage, um, and to encourage you, Louise, although in my now quite lengthy experience of knowing you, you don't need any encouragement to make my life as difficult as uh, you want to, because it's by doing that that we will make the progress that we still so badly need to make to get to a point where gender equality is something that is a reality, not something uh, we still aspire to um, in the future. So uh, thank you for all of the work that you're doing to help make that a reality. Um, I'm very grateful to you, Louise, for uh, leading uh, this so ably to all of the council members uh, who uh, do so much uh, work and to all of you, it's fantastic to see so many of you here today having these conversations. Um, this year, of course, uh, 2020, marks quite an important anniversary in this context. Come September this year, it will be exactly 25 years since the United Nations adopted the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. These documents at the time provided a very ambitious framework for advancing women's rights across the world. And they helped to rally governments and international organisations uh, right across the world to do more to promote equality. And on the positive side, I, I think we can say that in the years since, the Beijing Declaration has helped to drive and to inspire significant progress. Uh, life for women and girls in many countries is now very different uh, to how it was 25 years ago. To give just one example, in today's world, uh, more countries provide constitutional guarantees on gender equality than has ever been the case before. So there have been significant victories, and I'm a great believer in the need to celebrate and own these victories, even as we recognise the significant progress that we still need to make. And there is significant progress that we still need to make, because notwithstanding these victories, it is very clear uh, today that gender equality in many respects is still a cause that is unwon. And I would go further than that and echo the comment that Louise made, uh, because it's not just that there are areas where we haven't yet made significant progress. We live in a world today where it feels uh, very often, sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis, that we face a regression, that we face a real backlash against some of the progress that has been made. Not just in gender equality, but when we look at issues of race and, and migration, uh, that there is now a need uh, not just to make further progress, but to very deliberately protect the progress we've already made, not to allow it to be pushed backwards. Um, I often say that whatever challenges I faced and my generation of, of women faced 
growing up, and they were many. Some of these challenges still exist today. Uh, there are challenges uh, that are faced by the current generation of uh, young women that I and my generation didn't face. The sexism and misogyny that is so prevalent in our society today and finds so many more direct ways through social media of impacting on young women is something that I didn't experience growing up and it is just one example of the ways in which we cannot rest in our laurels. We must push forward uh, but we must also be vigilant about uh, the efforts of those who want to push us backwards instead. Um, I firmly believe, and I, I hope I demonstrate this in not just what I say as First Minister, but also in what I do, that advancing the cause of gender equality should be a central driving priority for any country. Not just because it's the, the right thing for women and for girls, but it's the right thing for everybody. Countries, uh, indeed companies and organisations, are stronger and better if they fully harness and utilise the talents and the skills and the abilities uh, of women uh, just as they do with men. So as First Minister, I want to make sure that Scotland leads the way and that in leading the way, we also play our part in encouraging and pushing forward progress elsewhere across the world. Um, I want the generations of women and girls that come after me to grow up with equal opportunities and a truly equal society and not to have to fight the same battles uh, that my generation and the generations before mine uh, have had to fight uh, repeatedly. Uh, so that's why the Scottish Government is taking significant action. Uh, we're taking action across a range of issues to support women in work, to tackle violence against women, to tackle uh, and break down gender stereotypes. And it's that ambition that also led me to establish the Advisory Council on Women and Girls because I want to continually be challenged on this front. I want to know what more we can and must do as a government and as a society to tackle these persistent inequalities that we know still exist. Uh, a few weeks ago, I received uh, your latest report, your latest uh, attempt to make my life difficult, which I... Uh, thank you for. Uh, once again, this year, I am uh, delighted to say that it is a, a comprehensive, ambitious, thought-provoking and challenging uh, document. Uh, and I want to uh, take the opportunity to thank everyone who contributed to that. That, of course, includes uh, members of the council, members of the circle, and all those who participated digitally or through the monthly spotlight events and I, I want to come on in a moment to talk about some of the report's recommendations but before I do that I, I want to firstly say something about your first report from the start of uh, last year. I'm uh, always conscious that and this is true of any government uh, I would like to think it's less true of the Scottish government but it's true of any government that sometimes we move on to the next report before we check that we've done what we need to do to deliver on reports that come before. So it's important not to lose sight of the recommendations you made to me last year because uh, that report and the recommendations continues to have a very significant impact. Um, in fact, when we published our programme for government back in September for the year ahead, that programme for government included all uh, seven of the recommendations that you made last year and we accepted. And in the months since then, we've continued to make progress on each of them, and we will continue uh, to do that. For example, you recommended last year improvements to the services we provide for victims of sexual violence. And in November, our bill on forensic medical services was introduced to the Scottish Parliament that ensures that victims can access health care and forensic medical examinations without first making a report to the police. So a very tangible action that came from a very important recommendation that you made. You also recommended the incorporation into Scots law of the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, again, we accepted uh, the vision behind that and since October, the National Task Force on Human Rights Leadership has been exploring how we take that recommendation forward in practice. Uh, you also suggested the setting up of a new commission to advance equality in education 
and next month we will see the very first meeting of the new Task Force on Gender Equality in Education and Learning. Uh, that will be co-chaired by Rosanna Hussain, a Young Scot Ambassador, uh, and the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney. Uh, I know from all of you that you do get a sense of the impact your work is having and how seriously we take the recommendations that come from the Council. Uh, and I want to assure you today uh, of that fact that we will continue to move forward to implement the recommendations that you made. And with that in mind, I want to turn to your most recent report. The focus this time, of course, was on, ge on gender uh, coherence in public policy and making sure that all of our policy interventions are coherent and they add up to meeting uh, the goals that we set. That's a hugely important topic. It's one that I think you were right to tackle and I, I make uh, no bones about it. It is often an issue that is difficult and challenging uh, for governments to take forward. Uh, I'm not going to respond in detail to every single one of the recommendations in the report today because it's right that we take time to consider each recommendation carefully and respond to them in detail in due course, but I do want to uh, endorse them very uh, firmly today in principle, and obviously we will respond uh, more fully when we can come and tell you how we're going to take all of them forward in detail. But it is worth just giving you one or two immediate thoughts today, and I want to start with what I, I hope will be uh, a very welcome announcement and actually something that shows a very quick response to one of the central recommendations in the report. Uh, the report recommends that the equalities unit that currently sits within the Scottish Government should become a standalone directorate. Now that sounds quite technical, but it's actually quite important because it is a, a signifier of the importance uh, that we give to issues of equality. Um, and we've considered that already since uh, we had sight of that recommendation uh, over the past few weeks. The Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government, Leslie Evans, commissioned an internal review. Uh, and I'm able to say today that we are going to do exactly that and uh, create a new Directorate of Human Rights, Equality and Inclusion to make sure that these issues that you are putting very firmly on the agenda are right at the heart uh, of everything we do in the Scottish Government and how we do it. So that will very firmly and directly raise the status of the government's equalities work and it will send a, a signal not just internally within the Scottish Government, although it will very definitely do that, but it will also send a signal externally of the importance and the status that we attach uh, to this work. Uh, I can also uh, confirm today that we do accept uh, your proposal for a senior officials and leaders group. Uh, we think that could provide an additional uh, level of leadership and oversight and we will uh, now consider uh, the right model uh, for meeting the aims uh, which you've set out. Uh, now, as I said a moment ago, these kind of structural changes I know can sound pretty abstract if you don't know the uh, nuts and bolts of how the Scottish Government works, and trust me, you probably don't want to know the nuts and bolts of how the Scottish Government works. Uh, a directorate or a leaders group might not sound uh, particularly exciting. But these things are really important and they, they do matter. Uh, but they only help if they are consistent with and help to drive changes in our wider approach to policy making. Uh, and your recommendations here on national standards for policy professionals, on the need for robust data, and also on the role of the wider public sector, these are also really important. Uh, equality needs to be at the heart of the policy making process at every level in Scotland, and we need to ensure that more people are involved directly in the decisions uh, that affect them. And it's maybe worth putting that point uh, in a broader context. I was struck by a quote in your report from one of your youth circles that Louise had previously uh, drawn to my attention. An 11-year-old had been asked uh, what she wanted to tell me uh, about policy making in Scotland said simply that it should be kind. Uh, and I thought that was a really profound <laughs> but really uh, lovely uh, statement. Um, because in many ways, that actually goes to the heart of everything that the Scottish Government should be doing and the way in which we should be doing 
it. In recent years, we've very deliberately placed a much stronger emphasis on ensuring that our policies enhance people's well-being, that they don't just focus on growing the economy with no regard to whether people are happy and fulfilled or whether how we grow the economy is harming our planet or not. Uh, it puts well-being right at the heart of the decisions uh, that we take, and that's at the heart of our uh, national performance framework. The values of kindness, dignity and compassion uh, should drive the work of any government anywhere in the world. So we're trying to make that central uh, to all of our policy making, uh, but we'll achieve that better if we listen to uh, and work with uh, those who are affected by our decisions. And uh, this council's recommendations underline the importance, I think, of embedding that approach and making sure that the objectives uh, we talk about uh, can be delivered uh, how we go, uh, through how we go about uh, making our policy. Now, the same uh, principle, of course, of making sure that we have real-life experiences of women and girls uh, at the heart of all of our policy making applies to the work of the Advisory Council as well. I know that Louise and the Council members have made enormous efforts to involve and engage with as many women and girls across the country as possible, um, and that is reflected very much in the growth of the circle. Uh, you know, I understand more than a thousand members of the circle from all across the country, which is twice as many as this time last year. Uh, however, the year ahead presents a new challenge. Uh, in year three, the council has chosen uh, to explore in more depth the, the status of women in Scotland with a specific focus on intersectionality, on how different forms of inequalities overlap and interact with each other. And for that topic, it is especially important that you engage as widely as possible. That means hearing from different groups of people whose voice too often is completely unheard and, and not listened to. Uh, Louise raised this issue with me earlier this month, uh, and at her suggestion, uh, I have invited uh, Dr Emma Jackson of Glasgow Caledonian University, who's here today, to join at the Council and to serve as co-chair in the year ahead, and I'm absolutely delighted that Dr Jackson has accepted uh, that invitation, and I think is a fantastic <laughs> addition. Dr Jackson brings to the Council valuable expertise and perspective on intersectionality and has significant experience engaging uh, with marginalised groups. So I know this has already contributed uh, to the work of the Council uh, and she will now help to ensure that going forward uh, that work is informed by an even wider section of women uh, and girls. Just to uh, conclude today, um, I started off by talking about the Beijing Declaration. Uh, those documents, of course, emerged from the Women of the World uh, conference. And one of the keynote speakers at that conference was Hillary Clinton, who at the time was First Lady of the United States. And her speech to the delegates was a, a very memorable one. It is one that is still remembered very well today. She summed up the importance of what was taking place uh, by saying... It's time for us to say here in Beijing and for the world to hear that it is no longer acceptable to discuss women's rights as separate from human rights. If there is one message that echoes uh, from this conference, let it be that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights at uh, once and for all. Uh, 25 years on, I don't think that message has become any less relevant or any less important. In fact, I think it is more relevant and more important even today than it was back then. Uh, women's issues are not a narrow side issue. They're not something that we uh, only think about in terms of the rights of a minority or that we consider after the fact when we're making policy. They are of fundamental importance, obviously of fundamental importance to women and to girls, but of fundamental importance to the kind of country and society that we are. As long as women and girls do not have the equality that we deserve, as long as uh, there are fewer opportunities or barriers, as long as women and girls face sexism and misogyny and don't get to fulfill their full potential in the same way as male counterparts, then not only do we do a disservice to women, 
uh, but we hold back society as a whole. Uh, so that's why it is so important that we continue to do this work, that you, all of you, at the council, the circle, people across the country continue to challenge the Scottish Government to make this a priority because by promoting gender equality here in Scotland, we make this country a better place, a fairer place, and we will make it a more prosperous place uh, and a better place to live. But we can also use our experience to drive the issue of gender equality uh, globally as well. Uh, this work has never been more important. So let me end as I began by thanking you for all the work you've done in the past year. Thank you for being here today, taking part in these discussions. And I very much look forward to working with all of you, uh, being challenged by all of you, having my life occasionally made difficult by all of you, occasionally, I said, uh, Louise. And together, if we stick at it, if we bring the passion and the commitment and the focus that this work needs, then here in Scotland, I believe we can create that fair, truly equal society that all of us want to see and every woman and girl now and in the future deserves. Thank you all very much indeed. Hi, Nicola. Hi. I would like to ask about changing some of the things, the problems that are if not uniquely Scottish, uniquely Scottish in degree, like the huge number of deaths from drug abuse, our problem with mm -hmm. alcohol, which mitigates against women, uh, you know, the, the links with domestic violence are well established. How can these things be integrated into this admirable um, policy initiative? Well, thank you for that question. I think it's an incredibly important question because it goes back to one of the things I said. You can't, women's issues are not some separate cohort of, of issues. Uh, all of these issues that we uh, talk about and prioritise have an impact on women and we need to see them in that gendered way as, as well as uh, seeing them as, as issues for society overall. Uh, to take the two you raise in particular, take alcohol for example. Um, Scotland has a long-standing problematic relationship with alcohol which contributes to, it's not the only issue, but contributes to a, a sort of generations-long uh, problem with lower life expectancy. Too many people in Scotland for decades have uh, develop diseases that are preventable, have died prematurely because of that relationship with alcohol. Um, and one of the issues, it's not the only issue, that drove the Scottish Government, and this was uh, legislated for when, when I was Health Secretary, uh, to introduce minimum pricing for alcohol, uh, was not just the health, public health impact, but that link, as you say, with domestic violence and, and, and other issues as well. And it's early days in that policy, but just yesterday we saw uh, statistics that give us an indication that that policy is actually starting to have an impact in work. Sales of alcohol in Scotland have reduced since that policy was introduced at a time when elsewhere across the UK they're still rising. So a, a real example of a policy driven very much by the kind of issues you talk about uh, that is already we think starting to have a practical impact. Uh, similarly on uh, drugs deaths, the Scottish Parliament will debate this um, at length tomorrow. Uh, an issue that has its roots uh, going back uh, probably two decades uh, when Scotland had a, a disproportionate uh, number of, of problem drug users, uh, a cohort that is getting older um, and developing uh, multiple health problems, dying prematurely. Um, that's not the only issue, but it's one of, of the issues. And we've got to, and, and the, the consequences of that for women in particular are, are significant. So we need to bring a different way of thinking as we did uh, to alcohol to try to address that. One of the most important things that we did with alcohol and similarly with drug misuse is not see it as a criminal justice issue, but very much as a public health issue and bring uh, that approach to tackling that in the way that we, we have to alcohol. So these things are central uh, to this debate um, and they are central to uh, the work that we're doing uh, in the Scottish Government and across uh, different parts of the country as well. Hi, uh, thanks so much for coming along. I just wanted to ask, how do you think Scotland can better protect disabled women and girls when often we're forgotten about and hit hardest by austerity and benefit cuts. What more can society do to protect us? Well, it, it comes on very 
firmly, I think, to the work that the council is going to be doing over the next year, that intersectionality, the fact that different inequalities overlap and, and interact. So women are not a homogenous group. Uh, women, by being women, face uh, discrimination and, and barriers, uh, but disabled women, uh, women from ethnic minority communities face a, a, a different set of, of discrimination and barriers, and we've got to understand how these interact. Uh, so I think the work of the council on, on this issue is going to be of you know, crucial significance over the next year. Um, we know, without having you know, a, a council delve into it, we know some of the, uh, the policy problems that are making this worse right now. Um, you know, I am not the only member of the Scottish Parliament that confronts this in constituency surgeries every single week with pretty brutal welfare cuts that have come about because of austerity, uh, compounding and exacerbating the challenges that people with disabilities, and yes, I think particularly women with disabilities, face on a daily basis. So some of that uh, as I say, we don't need in-depth studies to understand that. We need to get into a position where we are able uh, to stop policies that are doing people harm. And instead, as we're trying to do now through the new Social Security Agency in Scotland, which has limited Social Security power, but important uh, Social Security powers, build a system, whether it's in Social Security or anywhere else, that actually is about lifting people out of these situations, not driving them further in. So the, the work that the Council uh, will do over the next year, I think, will be a really important contribution to telling the Scottish Government what more we need to do and what more we can do within the levers we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, First Minister. I'm afraid we're kind of out of time now, but um, please feel free if you want to post your question on Twitter. Um, we'll kind of try and make sure that we figure out a way to get a response to that. But for now, um, please can you join me in thanking First Minister. Thank you.